welcome everyone. Today I have uh, Julia with me. I met her a few weeks ago in Marbella and when I saw this woman running along the promenade, I had only like one thought that immediately, you know, popped in my head. This woman is such an inspiration and I need to speak with her to find out what she's doing to maintain such a fitness and, and, and great shape. So today I have Julia with me that will be sharing with us her secrets to longevity and fitness. <laughs> Welcome, Julia. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. And what's so amazing is Sandra saw me running on the promenade in Marbella. And then we just ended up in the same cafe because I don't know how you yeah. to find me otherwise. But I just, you know, was drawn to this cafe and then you came over and then... That's how we're now speaking. I'm back in the UK and yeah. you're in the sun. I'm in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> so, Julia, could you tell us more about yourself as well? Because I followed your channel and I know you're like big runner since you've been very, very little. But also I know that you're doing a lot of other uh, things. So could you tell us a bit more about yourself your you know passions and a bit of life story <laughs> so sandra is now asking me to i'm 65 <laughs> i've been running i've been well i'm not quite 65 actually i'm 65 on may the 12th so i'm nearly 65 but i've been uh, running since i was well all my life but six years old when I was, oh, I want to, I want to be a runner. So really it's, you know, six decades. So there's a lot of stories. So I'll see if I can do a synopsis of it all. <laughs> Just <the key> highlights. <laughs> highlights. So I knew I wanted to run um, from a very young age as well. I was aware that really all that was of, um, you know kind of interest to me interest is a funny word but that the kind of a spiritual path the path of growth from you know I would say from eight years old I had a family that was very Christian so I was kind of in that world of of spirituality and very early I was aware of it not from the you know the kind of control of religion but I was aware of, of the that we're all born of consciousness that we're all one that we are like I like the Rumi quote that says, we're not a drop in the ocean, we're an ocean in one drop. So I was from a young age, mm. that awareness was there. I, in the early days, I read the Bible a lot. I moved into, I moved away from the church and moved away from organized religion. And then I remember one of, when I was 16, reading Jonathan Livingston Seagull. And that's a book by Richard Bark. And it's about the seagull that um, is practicing to fly really well. So it resonated with me with the running because I was aware that my running was part of my expression and I wanted to express my running as my soul in motion. And I, I knew that from very young. And in Jonathan Livingston Seagull, there's one quote that is resonant for probably the foundation of everything of my teaching and my work and my running is it's your whole body. And then he said, cause he was a seagull from wingtip to wingtip your whole body is nothing more than your thought itself in a form you can see break the chains of your thought and you break the chains of your body too so I had that awareness as a teenager and to do with my running to do with my life to do with everything and then I became a very good runner so now I said I'll do this as quickly as I can so lots of things happened I became very good I was evident I want I knew I wanted to run for England by the time I was 19, I was running for England and I ran for England and Great Britain between 1979, 1978 and 1993 from distances of 5,000, 5K on the cross country all the way up to marathon and mm. lots of stories there. But um, so I, <laughs> this is it, trying to do 65 years at the same time. Um, so around the time that I was 16 and all that was going on. My, I had lots of other things that tipped me out of, I was always a very spirited, adventurous, happy person. But around, at that same time at 16, my mother died. And also I was in a very unhealthy coaching relationship with my coach, mm -hmm. which not, uh, wasn't, wasn't good. 
for me. Um, and those things tipped me out of my center. And then I got caught up in an eating disorder and all sorts of things. So, but that mm. has informed a lot of my work with others because I had to work my way out of that, which I did, <laughs> so I'll do this in short. So at the same time, even in my twenties, as I was running at top level, I was still working through my eating issues, but I knew there was a way to be free. And in the learning to free myself, I've, I've got lots of skills that mean I've helped lots of people free themselves from all sorts of issues. Yeah. So when I was 19, I met my first husband, um, who's not the one you met me with. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra met me with my husband and Ardy. I met my yeah. first husband. We met running for England and we had an amazing time. And I've got nothing but good thoughts of him because we were very young and we set up a business together we both ran for England we both traveled the world together we and this gym I worked I worked for my coach first and then I worked then we set our own gym up he had a he had a gym in, and was innovative ahead of his time my coach and then even though it was a difficult time with him he had a lot that he also gave me my husband and I I knew very young that training programs need to be integral to the person's whole being. Yeah. But when I was in my late twenties, I was a personal trainer, one of the first personal trainers in the country. It was new in those days. That was, must've been 19, like late 1980s, 1990. And then all my clients would tell me their troubles. So then I went into training in systemic psychotherapy and so on and so forth. And then I've worked, mm. I've worked as a, coach a mentor a healer a teacher i've done that um national federation of spiritual healing because i've worked with quite a lot of dying people and one of my clients i took her to a spiritual healer and the healer said but you're a healer so i trained my hands and that was that helped a lot of the people i mean i'd still work with my hands oh. not, not just for people dying <laughs> and alongside that i was running i've run always and my my work I've always had a stream of people to my door and I've always done speaking and things but recently I've been doing more events because obviously there's a limit to how many people I can fit in my diary so I've been doing more yeah. events and there we are do you think did I manage <laughs> <laughs> creating bigger impact because I I think you have a lot of to share. <laughs> I think how am I going to do this in in uh, how am I going to tell you the last fifty or sixty years <laughs> in about five minutes? <laughs> didn't do too badly, did I? <laughs> Say again, sorry, didn't get I didn't that. Do too badly in fitting in six decades in about ten minutes. <laughs> I think you did very well <laughs> summarize you know what get you and I think you also kind of like confirm my theory that the mindset in no matter what we do is so crucial you know and yeah. the, the, the another thing actually I would like you to to ask you because I'm nutritionist so of course like the eating is a, like a oh. big part of it and you also mentioned like the eating disorder but is there any particular like diet that you follow now or you know because to run to train to be top runner you have to like fuel properly <laughs> and I love hearing you know different people's opinions so like what yeah, yeah what's your I, still, I still run fast for someone of 65 I can st well you you saw me Sandra saw me <laughs> I saw you on the um, on the oh my gosh I forgot the um, on the track on oh. the run I saw you, Julia. I was like truly impressed, like how fast you can go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I was born it. You know, I was born, I think we're born with a certain ingredients. Yes. So, so, yeah. eating. so my eating, um, I, I was very keen on healthy eating. My coach was keen on healthy eating. Um, as a child growing up, we just were not a family that, you know, had normal meal times. I mean, we did all that thing in the olden days where, we all sat around the table and had to eat and there wasn't mm -hmm. we weren't allowed to watch television that was all kind of rationed so I think it was just the family home I mean, I mean to be honest I had lots of sweets like so with my pocket money I liked all that I was mm -hmm. I was very relaxed and then when I started getting good at running my coach encouraged us to start you know eating more whole foods and whole grains and made sure there was you know good yeah. quality 
fruit and vegetables and pro all the natural things was encouraged. But then, unfortunately, that I obviously I tipped out with the eating issue because I'd obviously lost my mom. <clears throat> I came from a kind of background where high achieving was sort of emphasized, particularly with my dad, and I have no blame for him, but that was the the kind of um, orientation. And it's very typical of an eating disorder that you've got a high achieving family, a lost mother, but then also my coach was very um, keen on you know me achieving a lot. And I remember the day it kind of tipped out. He, I'd not run a very, I'd not run particularly well because I was a bit tired. I was very slit. I was very like the, my body it is now. And he just said to me, "You're too heavy. I think you need to lose some weight." And I was only you know 16 and of course that I wasn't too heavy but you know people have yeah. misguided, people don't see and as I say I don't have one of the things that I think is very key is to work through everything that there isn't the, any blame out there because of course it it limits us to, to yeah. take responsibility for our own journey um but it did tip me out and then I struggled with the eating so then it, there was a muddle for oh, quite a long time where I was really keen to have healthy eating but my feeding was dysfunctional so I would do binging and starving and there was all this kind of and when I would binge I'd eat things I didn't allow myself the other times so having ex had the extreme of dysfunctional eating I think that I really wanted to make sure that I had no rules part of the way of coming out of an eating disorder is to not have the structures and rules and got to's and have yeah. to all of that um and then what and I also had an intuition that if I didn't have an eating disorder then I would be a naturally very healthy person because I love to exercise I love to run I love to mm. you know I love to eat but my appetite is towards healthy foods which is why we the cafe we met in super healthy <laughs> and, and you mentioned carrot cake is one of your secrets <laughs> I, love carrot cake. I love with the thing is I also love cake I love almond croissants I love coffee but what I think I have is just a very natural orientation towards loving eating um you know fresh fruit vegetables I I have been vegetarian at times but it doesn't suit me I, I like eating first class protein. It feels better for my body. Um, I don't, I love sweet food. So I do love cake. I do love croissants. I don't overeat on them, but I really love them. Yeah. I don't have a structure. And, and when I, I mean, I've been, my eating disorder so long ago, it's nothing to do with me, but I really knew I didn't want to weigh, you know, get into weighing myself or structure. And so I just listened to my body massively. I do occasionally take, supplements I've got I'm, I'm quite relaxed about them I've got sometimes I there's a I'll have green food superfood mix that yeah. in um, I've got some at the moment I mix it in kefir or something I love smoothies and healthy things I like I occasionally supplement with B vitamins and C and what's the other one D only three you know I'm I, so I'm happy to supplement but I'm I don't I I'm very much have I think that if we're the main thing is relaxation the main thing is being present mm. the main thing is enjoying your life yeah I mean essentially and then food is part of our you know our appetite for life because if we've got yeah. good appetite for life we all have a lovely appetite for food food's not always for just for hunger it's for sharing with people having a piece of cake and coffee with a friend or you know yeah. I think it's more important than anything is relaxation and ease and presence it's and yeah. then the things spring from that because eating well is it's very natural and if we're relaxed we won't want to hurt ourselves by not eating enough or eating too much or eating too many processed foods we just naturally won't and when I had my eating issue I obviously had things I needed to work out. It wasn't the eating that was the problem. It was the, the pain inside. inside yeah. yeah. But I love what you said about like appetite for life and appetite for food. You know, I, I couldn't agree more yes. because from like my own story and experimenting with lots of diets and, you know, following the diet trends because you think, you know, oh, you should maybe be doing yeah. this or as well this. At some point I realized like, 
you know, we can be fancy with the diet, but if we don't reduce, you know, stress and yeah. our like emotional wellness and just as you said, living in the present and living and also like happy life, but keep it like simple, then yeah. You don't have the wrong cravings. You don't have those like, you know, no. sugar cravings as well. And eating is like way easier as well. And you don't have to restrict yourself because I also do believe and I'm big on, on that in my work on impact of stress. So I actually love that you that you mentioned uh, because when you when you relax when you do live well, you don't have to be fancy with, you know, food and and yeah. diets. And I think so the, core, the core of it is the stress. And ironically, when people get themselves caught up in, I can't eat this, I should eat that, I shouldn't eat this, I, they, they create stress. So it's stress on stress. And I see that with yeah. things, exercise as well. If, it, if it's an extra stress in their life, then it, they're better not to do it in a way, you know. Yeah. <laughs> It's like fine fine line between I how many I have to see you have and how many things you do because you want and you know you do I that with really the have tos and oughts and shoulds need to go completely because when we when we but I mean that can take a process I understand because there's so many layers of conditioning and societal family you know so many things that condition people yeah. to a place where you feel in your center and empowered to do things because you know you're, you're choosing them because of course we are choosing everything but we might not know that at times you know because yeah it much come from well you're choosing it but you don't know that it's coming from conditioning so yeah like kind of like running on autopilot until yeah. the day you become <laughs> aware of what's going on <laughs> yeah yeah no definitely that's so true okay uh, julia actually there is one more thing i'm very curious about as well because you when i saw you like your speed and your fitness it was of course like very impressive so how often do you train and you know how do you rec recover do you have any special you know routine or you just go with the with the with the flow i would say how how did they do you have any structure now or um i think i mean i train i train every day i mean a, a very occasionally oh. a day off but i train every day but then in the 80s 90s early late 70s oh and i drink lots of water <laughs> Just, <laughs> mm. um, hydration I, the key yeah, i and sleep well eat sleeping and hydration are a key but um I, yeah, I train every day, but then you see when I was an international athlete, I was running up to 100 miles a week, so 160 kilometers a week. So I was doing um, so much. Also, I have masses of energy. I've always, I mean, I was a very naughty child. I had so much energy. So I do have a lot of natural energy. And the more I've, you know, worked to make sure I've clear my, all my emotional baggage, of course, your energy stays high. And um, yeah. I think a lot of people's low energy mm. is unresolved issues that are kept stuck in the body um and so yeah I train every day I I haven't got as much structure this year because I've got such a busy year I have been more busy this year particularly as I'm doing the events and I'm working one-on-one -on -one and I've got this huge this running with Julia you run with Julia YouTube channel but I've got lots going on so I therefore I'm a bit more fluid with my training but last year I was um training a bit more structured so I mean it's always similar I'll do kind of a longer run on us so this has been for 50 years generally a longer run on a Sunday I'll do a longish and that now is probably only 10 miles or so whereas back in the day it was 20 um I'll do a run in the middle of the week that's a little bit longer sort of seven or eight used to be 15 and then I do two sessions a week generally that are faster um with some intervals in it and I'll do two times in the gym, sometimes three. And I think that's it. So yeah, it's got, but every day I do something. But so in other words, you're like full on. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't feel full on to me because it's so much less than I used to. I also swim, but I haven't swum recently. I, I, I swim sometimes where I get into a flow of it, doing it twice a week. But then I went to Lanzarote in December and went to Club La Santa, which is awesome. And they've got three 50 meter pools and it spoiled me for my 25 indoor meter pool here. I haven't quite got back into it. <laughs> <laughs> 
So yeah, um, so lots. Yeah. So I, but I always do generally I train in the mornings because, and I generally make sure I, I don't start with a client if I can help it till 10. Um, sometimes I started yesterday at nine just to fit someone in, but generally I don't start work till 10, which means I've always got time to train in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing, Julia. So I'm trying to work out with your, you know, longevity, fitness and wellness formula. So definitely eating without restrictions, training, moving a lot, yeah, release but... emotional baggage. Is there anything else that you would add when you look on your like whole life and, you know? Definitely at the core of it is release emotional baggage. And that is the center point of it. And therefore, really clearing it away and and one of the simplest ways to clear is to know that every single time we react to anything and when I say react get that feeling in the body that's either upset irritated cross annoyed anything that comes up in the body to know that that feeling in the body is an arrow to something in the past because it's never going to be about what's in front of you it doesn't mean that you don't need to deal with the thing in front of you. So if somebody's not done as you wanted or you're in a relationship you don't want to be in or something to address, it's not saying you don't need to address it, but the reactivity is the bit that loops round and is something to do with the past. And really we need to press pause, breathe deeply, come back to center, let that feeling clear out of the body. And we can you can gradually get insights as to where it first came from. And it can be a reminder of, wow. you know, something in childhood so I teach people that all the time and by clearing that over time clearing 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 that is the one thing the essence of presence really and being where you are and then from that of course moving but not over moving I mean I think that at times in my 20s and I did too much and I was coming from too much pressure too much um you know trying to get somewhere but mm. I, was, I was learning, you know, you go in cycles. So I, but that doesn't mean I don't set goals. They're fun, but it is staying in the process and not being attached to that outcome. It's great to have it there. Um, so I think moving, um, but moving, enjoying it, having fun, doing it, you know, different, changing things around. Um, obviously sleep, I think is very key and drinking lots of water and um, eating, but not, but without restriction. Yeah but enjoying it it's amazing and it's fun and um just really knowing your essence and loving yourself I mean I mean not but deeper than there's a lot written about loving yourself now but people don't really know what that means I don't think I think it means being so still that you experience your true self which is beyond any of these things that are attached to our identifications with what we've done or haven't done or you know who who we yeah present That's actually, well. you touch on a very important topic as well because self-love is such a like slogan nowadays oh, yeah. and people don't know what it means because of course you get caught up with oh I've got to love myself because I've done well or but what happens when you don't do well and of course it's it's deeper than that it's about knowing who you truly are and that experience and that's where being coming back to the breath the breath anchors the mind and coming back to the place inside you which isn't caught up with the mental constructs and the identifications and all those things I think then it's it's just fun being here and it's experience rather than, <laughs> yeah rather than it and has, I think, yeah 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 sorry carry on <laughs> oh, no it's just an experience and we're here for such a short time um that we might as well um really love it my mum gave me a great legacy because she died as I say when I was 16 and she was great. She loved, she loved life. I mean, she, you know, she died very young. She died at 50, but she always said to me, oh, darling, have fun. Darling, have fun. Um, we're here to have fun. And that, so I'm having fun. She left me that legacy and <laughs> I've lived may, way longer than she lived. And I thought- And you're oh. continuing that legacy because <laughs> from what I met you so far, I exactly get this kind of vibe and feeling Julia that you're just having fun with life and something you mentioned before I started recording our chat you also mentioned you sold you all your possession six oh. months six years digital nomads without yes, any possession that. traveling yes. Yeah, we did that. And I was 53 and Nadi's younger than me. Nadi's eight years younger than me. But we were in Santorini together and he said, why don't we travel more? And I said, well, if we're going to travel more, why do we need to own anything? And he said, well, <laughs> I'm up for that. So we shared everything. 
time. Um, and that was in 2012 and spent six years just with what we could carry. I had to, needed a computer to work with my clients. A lot of my yeah. clients flew out to me and did intensive work. I'd come back to the UK every six weeks and see people in person, but I worked online. And something else, of course, is I work with people and have done all my life. And often they're in really difficult places. And I, I have the capacity to hold their pain, hold the space, hold, help them. I work with a lot of young people too. I've, my age range actually is probably 26 years old, to actually 89, but I have a great lot of people sort of late twenties to early forties and mm. often having a lot of difficult stuff, but I don't find that takes away from my joy. I mm. have the capacity to help them find theirs rather than yeah. they're taking anything from me. I, I feel that mine comes through me as a source energy and therefore it doesn't, people often say, well, doesn't it impact on you? It doesn't mean I don't have huge love and compassion and empathy for their processes. Yeah. It doesn't take away my joy. And I think I the other way around that I can help them find theirs. Yeah, that's amazing that you can like have that also, you know, find that balance because sometimes it can actually take a lot of your energy, but that's amazing. You can still, you know, help people share that space, but also preserve your your energy. Because like I think, yeah, also one when, when, um, thing that you mentioned before um, about like self-love and true self. And I think what's like so important because you feel like, all in experience life have fun but I think what's what's challenge for a lot of us is actually overcome that fear to try something is it actually right for me is does it feel good you know come out of our like bubble and also the conditioning you mentioned so I, I think it's I've always um been somebody who doesn't mind making mistakes and I mean it's funny given the family I was born into because um it was yeah quite a traditional kind of British family but I don't mind making mistakes I don't mind them being public mistakes I don't mind having to say oh I didn't that didn't that's not right for me I need to turn yeah and, and I think that that's been and and I don't mind trying things and I don't mind yeah going for it and it is shedding that conditioning and shedding the yeah, thing, the, yeah shedding fear really I mean that's at the core of it isn't it yeah, and that's what makes us humans as well, you know, we are not born to be perfect, <laughs> we are just humans to experience, you know, and find our own ways of, you know, living and, and being. I think, I think, well, the thing with the human journey is that um, I think that we're all actually spiritual beings on a human journey, and a lot of people forget their their essence and and lots of people it isn't necessarily their path to find it because they you know in some yeah some people don't want to they might prefer to be identified with the mind and the human um but but really we're i don't think there's any beginning or end to us and the human journey is an experiential one and um and we can't be where we're not so therefore if somebody that's why it's very there's a lot again, as you said, about self-love, spirituality, but it it doesn't really help people because really, as you said, people just need to experience themselves and um, and whether they are, are open to their deeper the truth of who they are, that's their journey. And if they don't in this lifetime, they will in another, whenever that is. So yeah. it's about not trying to be something we're not. Yeah, definitely. I have Julia impression we could like talk for ages and I love how we went from like running and fitness to deep life. Oh, yes. <laughs> Questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe the, the last thing I, I wanted to ask you because you're doing so much. Is there anything particular that you're focusing this year? Because you mentioned you run events, you also keep training. Is there anything, you know, uh, ahead big for this year for you I think really because I've all everything's I still I, I love my running I've got races ahead I love um my run with Julia channel which I put the, you know I put a video up month uh, Wednesdays and the weekends and I interview people and I go to races I love that I love my one-on-one -on -one work and couple work I do a lot of that's that's always going on 
But um, the thing I think this year, I in 2023, I said, right, 2024 is the year where I do more with my events. And so this year, really, that's more the focus. And I've got a new YouTube channel called Silence is Freedom. Yeah, that's ah. it. Freedom. It's very early days. I did an event in January called The Truth of Who You Are. And the, that video of that event is on the channel. Um, I've got a Facebook group called Conversations with a Bodhisattva, which I had all through lockdown where I appeared every day to give people kind of, you know, people ask questions. I did chanting twice a week and every day every people would ask me things. So I've kept it going a little bit. I just did it for a year. But now on a Monday, we, I do a chant meditation. And on a Thursday, I do a com I do 20 minutes just talking. And at the moment, it's about relationship because... My event on the, in January was the truth of who you are. And that, as I say, is up on the YouTube channel. And then I'm, I'm putting the little ones up. And then on the 5th of April, I'm doing a, a relationship um, event called The Space Between Us, because of course, relationship yeah. is obviously in the space between us. And I've now employed an event manager called Jane. Um, and she's been finding me the spaces and she's been amazing. And I've just, just, yesterday started with Chris who is going to do PR for me and she I'm having a lovely interview week because she interviewed me for some copy and everything yesterday and she's going to help spread the word and I thought essentially doing more events and communicating you know what I eventually teach you know one yeah. or one more in the world and so it's so interesting I should also meet you at this point <laughs> where I'm I'm saying, right, let's, so that really, everything else is is going along still. Yeah. But the thing I'm focusing on is my um, new, my new, uh, it's funny to call it a business. I mean, it's got a bank account and it's got a thing because. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever you call it, I guess like the most important is, you know, your like engagement and also the impact you're making because you're having like great, you know, wisdoms and insights to share with people. That's why I think you should do that on bigger scale as well. So yes. more people can, you know, hear, you know, what you're doing, your journey as well and how that can help them as well to to improve life. And so it was the it was the willingness to go up I've been I've thought it for a little while that particularly during lockdown when I was doing conversations with a bodhisattva I thought well I can't reach as many people just seeing them one-on-one -on -one. and you know my running channel is yeah. fun but it isn't I love it and it's kind of obviously coming from the same energy but actually being able to teach what I you know my whole yeah work I do with people on a bigger scale and um, um, that's that's yeah. what's beginning in 20 and it was employing Jane and Chris that's the commitment to okay. <laughs> it's just if I've got a team I've just got to follow really <laughs> exactly I'm, I want to say I'm now leading. you have like a proper team <laughs> I'm leading but I'm following if that makes sense <laughs> Jane keeps saying to me oh I found a lovely space here and Chris is that you know Pete there so I'm and two great women so it feels like right off we go <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, Julia. As I said, like, uh, I could talk with you for like hours, but I am also mindful uh, about the time. So before we finish, is there anything else you would like to, you know, share or? Because um, we cover quite a lot, but maybe yeah. there is. I'd, I'd say that um, I think I think we are here to have fun. And if you're not having fun, then it's important to press pause and notice that so that you can at least start to become aware of areas that feel that they're not working because I think too many people accept that oh this is just life and it isn't mm -hmm. I think it's yeah to notice and then there are lots of resources there are people like me there are if if that's not affordable there are resources like what we're doing now there's lots now on YouTube there are books just to start to investigate you know what might be um, going on to mean that things aren't fun. Um, so yeah. that's key because it ideally life, you know, life, we've got the potential for it to be amazing. And, but it sometimes is a journey to find that. 
Yeah, and it's funny you're mentioning this because just like a few hours ago, like a post popped on my feed about that the pain, whatever it's physical or emotional pain we experience, it's not something, you know, to get rid of. It's just a message for us to show us something. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very interesting you're just mentioning. Yeah, uh, now. we have to feel to heal. I think we, if we are in pain, we need to feel it go into it. Um, and it will, um, you know, we can we can go right back to the source. That's why when I said about clearing reactivity, we can go back right to the source of whence it came and, and clear it. Yeah. But really? Sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Julia, it was great chatting with you and get your story and you know, what you've been like doing was your motivation and also your wisdom. So... Uh, I will put all your links to your YouTube and other pages in the description as well. So people can also follow you and get more of your wisdoms and positive energy as well, because I think that's much needed nowadays. Thank you. Well, it's been a, a, yeah, a joy, joy to talk with you. So thank so, you. Thank everybody. Thank you, everybody who might watch this. Um, it's, uh, yeah, no, <laughs> thank it's you fun. so much. <laughs> Okay, perfect. So I will stop recording here.